So there are some that are saying that uh, right now we are experiencing a golden age of storytelling. There's been all kinds of periods, of course, throughout history where there has been great works of literature, uh, great works of film. But when you think about all that is available to us now, right? I mean, you not only have all the books that have been published in, in paper and ink, but in the digital world, we, we, stories abound, right? Libraries are popular. Bookstores are even popular. Do you know Barnes & Noble is expanding? <laughs> wow. I mean, that's crazy, right? But maybe one of our favorite form of stories uh, is streaming TV shows, right? I mean, Stranger Things? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Uh, let me see. Ted Lasso? That's an easy one, right? Just, uh, what else? Someone tell me another one that you really love. Or if you want to admit it, I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> you don't have to admit a, a show that you've binge watched, right? We've even invented a term for it. We binge watch. Because we love these stories and we can't wait till the next episode comes out or the next season comes out. And, and there's something about those stories that when we watch them, they just kind of get into us, right? I mean, because you... You're, you talk to a friend and you say, did you watch the last episode? Have you started that season yet? They kind of get into you and they just, and it's in a sense that the, the story just continues to live in you somehow. And, and that's rewarding. We love that. It's not like it, we, after we watch the uh, uh, season of Ted Lesso, we come out with a three-step plan of how to improve our life, <laughs> right? But there, there are scenes there, there are phrases that were said. There were moments. And, and they stay with us. One of the, one of the uh, ways I like to read stories is in the form of memoirs. Uh, I love hearing and reading people's stories. And there are all kinds of formats anymore uh, that you can read people's stories. Um, it, it, I just love hearing that. I, what, what is it they went through? What, what happened in their life? And... Um, I mean, generally in a memoir, someone talks about difficulty that they went through. But how did they overcome that? How do they, how do they adapt from that? And it's, in, and it's inspirational to me. It inspires me to read those things, whether it's written by some, a person of faith or not. I just love hearing and reading people's stories. And the thing about memoirs is that it, <laughs> it's their story, right? I can't tell them their story is wrong. I can't tell them, because I've not lived their life. I've not lived their experience. How, how could I tell them their story is wrong? So it's this uh, uh, wonderful thing of, of reading somebody's story, just letting it be what it is. And often, of course, in a memoir, it's stories of how they went from great difficulty to being okay. You might even say it's like a, a story of salvation. That might not be a bad way for us to think about the Bible. The Bible, really, from beginning to end, is, is the story of salvation, made up of all kinds of shorter stories of salvation. Now, I know when you say salvation, uh, in, in our context, sometimes immediately people think of all the loaded ways that we think of that term. You know, like people are saying, have, have you been saved? Are you born again? as if it's a one-moment experience, a one-moment decision. Well, not at all. Actually, the Bible doesn't even talk about it that way. No, it's about, it's about that God had a, an intention expressed as we read in creation, that this creation would be in harmony, that this creation would, would uh, work together and be connected, and that that creation would also be in a right relationship with God, the Creator. That was the intention. Uh, but, of course, we humans tend to want to do things our own way. And, and, and all of a sudden, there was, there was disunity. There was dysfunction. There was dis-ease. And, and, it, and it fractured the relationship with God. And so, somewhere along the way, God works to try to address that so that people go from a place of this disunity and discord and disconnect to a place of restoration. That's the story of salvation. Time and time and time again through the Bible. 
I mean, you know the, the hymn Amazing Grace, right? I once was lost, now I'm found. Once was blind, now I see. I mean, that's, that's what salvation is. And so the Bible is the continual story of salvation from the creation that God intended it to be to when you read Revelation 21, 22, the ultimate vision of restoration of the original creation. And so the Bible is these stories of salvation over and over and over and over because I don't know about you, but friends, I, I need salvation sometimes on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. So it's the story of salvation. John Wesley, uh, the founder of the Methodist movement, I mean, if you've heard of him, <laughs> he's got some books out. No podcast, but uh, he's got some books out. Uh, John Wesley uh, once said of himself, he is a man of one book. A man of one book. Now, again, in our day and time, we hear that, and we might think of, which was the Bible, by the way. It was the Bible. He's a man of one book, the Bible. Uh, and, and in our day and time, you hear that, and you might think, oh, no, someone who's a literalist, someone who's a fundamentalist. Well, John Wesley was not that at all. As a matter of fact, just parenthetically, this is for free. So, um, I mean, not everybody knows that the, the whole notion of the fundamentalist movement didn't even start until the late 19th century and the early 20th century. It's kind of a new phenomenon in the Christian world. We'll come back to that another time. So... <laughs> Uh, he was certainly not that. I mean, he was a very, very well-educated man. I mean, he, re he, he read, he studied, he wrote all kinds of topics. His best-selling book in England was about health and wellness called A Primitive Physic. He was known and regarded as a very smart man. So now he had his convictions, certainly. He had his understanding of what the Bible said, what it meant. Uh, he had his convictions about Christian belief, but... But he also understood all these different perspectives and was in conversation with all these different perspectives. But clearly gave priority to the Bible because that's our book, right? I mean, world religions have their book. The Bible is our book. So John Wesley gave it priority. That's something that is important to us. Unfortunately, the Bible has been misused in lots of ways. And unfortunately, it's been used to justify violence. It's been used to justify dehumanizing other people. It's been used to draw dividing lines of who's in, who's out, who's okay, who's not. Which is, which is really a complete misunderstanding and a misuse of the Bible. The Bible talks about including the Bible talks about love. The Bible talks about becoming. The Bible talks about community. So unfortunately, in our day and time, we see plenty of uses, misuses of the Bible. And generally, I mean, at the, at the root of that are people who are wanting to justify their own power over others while holding a Bible in their hand. And that's just not what the Bible's about. That's just not what it's about. But, but this is not new. I mean, you know that. Look back in history, right? There have been a lot of things where people have justified uh, injustice and oppression, uh, violence with the Bible. This is not new. It's been going on a long time. As a matter of fact, Paul, Paul told Timothy this was going to happen. 2,000 years ago, he told him this is going to happen. As he... Again, I say Paul was instructing Timothy because Paul's at the end of his life and his career, and so it's a, it's a leadership transition. <laughs> He's training Timothy to say, hey, as you go forward as, as a leader in this church, here's some things you need to know. Here's some things you need to, some very practical things, ways to proceed in leading the church. And so what was read a little bit ago was, was a part of a larger section. And if you kept reading just into chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 4, he says, Preach the word, be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. 
correct, comfort, and encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. It's not a new thing, is it? It's not a new thing. Now, of course, we all have to be careful about that. We all have to be careful about trying to put ourselves in the place of saying, well, I know exactly everything it's about, and, and those people are wrong. Well, now we've just kind of turned it around. We're just doing the same thing. So it's got to be something more than that than simply opposing uh, perspectives, arguing over what the Bible says and what's right and what's wrong. There's got to be something a little more to it than that because that's, that's just a downward spiral. It'll never end. Because part of the challenge is, is that we all have our own perspectives. I mean, one of the words, the, the, you know, the buzzwords that's been used now for several years is bias. We all have a bias about things. We prefer, it's like a preference. I prefer this or I prefer that. And we have biases and then often we read the Bible and we find support for our biases. There's a cartoon I saw, uh, uh, I, when I saw it, it was very old. It was by Charles Schultz. Anybody know who Charles Schultz was? Yeah, yeah, cartoonist did the Peanuts cartoons, right? But he also did other cartoons. And there was one where it, lo- what it, it depicts what looks like a, a teenage boy lying on the floor in their probably living room or something. He's got an open book in front of him on the floor. And like I said, it was a long time ago. You know, book. <laughs> so anyway, a, an iPad. Let's just say it's an iPad. And, and his sister's standing uh, over him, and she says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm looking for verses in the Bible to back up my preconceived notions. <laughs> I mean, we've all done that, right? We all have to be careful about that, about trying to put ourselves in the seat of the I'm right and they're wrong. We all have to be careful about that. But how do we, how do we understand our perspective from a place of humility? to approach the Bible with great humility, to understand maybe it's not me interpreting the Bible, maybe, maybe this is a mirror that is interpreting me. That's a little bit different way to look at it. So the Bible is full of stories. It's almost like a compilation of stories of salvation of God's people through all time. So Paul, and Paul is instructing Timothy about the nature and the function of the Scripture, and one of the things he says is that the, the, all Scripture is inspired. Now, a couple of other words that get used for this are, some people say it's infallible, some say it's inerrant. I've just always found it curious why I use words that are not the way the Bible itself describes it. Why do we feel the need to add to it? Because the word inspired, the more literal translation is, It is God-breathed. It is God-breathed. I don't know why you would need to add to that or qualify that. It is God-breathed, which is the same word that is used when back in Genesis it says that God had formed the humans and breathed life into them. Wow, maybe the same breath, maybe the same spirit of God that was at work in the very beginning in creation is the same Spirit of God that is at work as we engage the Scripture. That's remarkable. I don't know how you could beat that. How, how do you need to describe that any differently? So, because it is the story of salvation, he says it is, it is helpful for teaching. Yes, for correcting. Now, that doesn't mean punishment. That doesn't mean rejection. I mean, I need correction. I need to be corrected. I need a course correction now and then. I need to understand things differently. I need to learn and grow. That's what the Bible can be useful for, so that. Now, I'm, you'll find out. I'm big on the so that. It's one thing to do something, to believe something. Okay, but so that what? What's the so that? So that as it says when I can find my place. That the person of God may be proficient. Now proficient, just skilled. Uh, uh, They've got it mastered. 
They do it well. That they may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Equipped for every good work. Ultimately, salvation delivers us, each one of us, in our own stories from a place where things were not so great to a place of restoration. I hope you're thinking of some of the salvation stories in your own life even as I talk about this. We all have them. I once was this, and now I'm this. We all have our own salvation stories, and the important part to me is that that salvation story is so real that people can see it in us. As you know, you've heard the saying, preach at all times, if necessary, use words. Right? So that we live out the story of salvation in a way that people see us learn and grow, that people see us exhibit the characteristics of Jesus. We follow the teaching example of Jesus. They see that. There's a saying, you've probably heard it, uh, that uh, you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. You are the only Bible that some people will ever read. To me, that's about giving priority to the Scripture. That's about truly taking it in and letting its story influence me, letting the story live in me so that I carry it everywhere I go. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you a great example of this. I was serving in a church, a very small town, rural area, and uh, the church I served was in a neighborhood, and right across the street was a house where one of the two town doctors lived, uh, and, and he was married, had, had his wife, and they had four little kids. Her name was Jean, and so one day, I, uh, I hadn't lived there very long, and I was just kind of teasing her, and I said, hey, well, Gene, you know, you can't ever skip church because we're going to sit here and look across the street and say, well, why aren't they here? And, you know, she chuckled and she said, well, actually I will be here. And she said, so let me tell you my story. She grew up in Ohio and uh, she was uh, in a, a family with quite a few siblings, not a gigantic family, but several siblings, and, and they were a poor family. Uh, they, you know, they never got brand new clothes. They always got hand-me-downs. And when they did receive any kind of gift, like at Christmas, it was something very practical. She remembers getting hairbrushes at Christmas. So that was the kind of family they lived in, and the parents were not religious at all. I mean, in any way. They just never went to church. They didn't do anything. And yet there was a church in the next block down the street. Well, she knew kids from school and such that, that uh, went to church, and so she just told her parents. She said, I just told them I was about third grade. And I said, I don't want to go to church. So one Sunday, they, she got dressed, got put a dress on, and they walked her down to the church, and they met somebody at the door, and they said, our daughter wants to go to Sunday school in church. And they said, well, that's wonderful. So sure, she can come in. And so the parents then went home. So she went to Sunday school and church and enjoyed it very much. And so from that day on, on Sundays, she got herself ready, and she walked down to church and went to church and came back. She said the person who influenced her the most was probably her Sunday school teacher. Now, this was, this was a few years ago, uh, and when you, when you picture you know, people sitting in church a few years ago, men were wearing suits and women were wearing dresses, right? But then there's always that, that, that quintessential woman at a church who is dressed just exactly right, that was very uh, dignified and uh, you know, never raised her voice, never misspoke, uh, did everything just right. Everybody thought, oh, she's kind of the model back back in the day and that person was her Sunday school teacher so uh, so you know time goes and it, it's getting close to Easter and so her parents uh, call her in and say we have a we're gonna give you a gift it was a wrapped present I mean she was just floored I mean why how, why 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 and and they said well we know uh, and so she opened it and it was this this pair of white sneakers and they said, well, you know, we know this is Easter weekend coming up, and, you know, you're supposed to wear white shoes, and so, but they needed to be practical, so you can wear these, you know, to school and such. Well, she was just elated, and she went down to the, as she walked to the church, she said, I was just floating, going to church with these brand new shoes. She had never had brand new shoes at that time of her life. And goes in, and of course, there's more kids in the class that day, because it's, well, it's Easter. And they all had brand new clothes on, and all the girls had white dress shoes, and at some point, one of the girls began to make fun of her for the sneakers. 
and to tell her, you don't wear those to church. Why are you wearing those to church? And ultimately, she began to try to step on her feet, on her shoes to smudge them and dirty them. A couple of other girls uh, saw that, thought it was funny, and they came over and started trying to do the same. Well, the teacher stopped it as fast as she could. You know, these things happen in a flash. She stopped it as fast as she could. Told everybody to sit back down. And Jean said, I did everything I could to hold back tears. She was humiliated, of course. So after, at the end of the uh, Sunday school, um, everybody was leaving, and she said, uh, Jean, could you stay back? And she said, she, she did, and she said, I really thought I was in trouble. And she said, after everybody left, she, the, the teacher went over to the sink and, and got a cloth and came back and said, and, and Jean thought, I, she's going to hand me the cloth to clean my shoes. And she, but she didn't. She walked over to Jean and got on her hands and knees and cleaned her shoes. And she said, Pastor Jeff, I'll always be at church. That was part of her story of salvation. She saw the gospel lived out right in front of her. She experienced it. And it changed her life. As we live our story of salvation and as people see that in us, we not only experience salvation, we become messengers. We become advocates. We become uh, channels of salvation for others so that they too can know of the love and grace of Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen.